Um, good afternoon. So I'm going to talk about one of the big challenges for the data sciences, and that is predicting, particularly predicting the social behavioral outcomes for groups and organizations and communities and so on. Now, it's, everyone knows there's lots of data. There's more data than we've ever had before. But the reason prediction is, is very difficult has to do with the nature of that data. It's not only large, it's geotemporally completely crazy. And it's also, we have access to actually a lower fraction of it for any particular problem than we've ever had before. The data is increasingly constrained by policies coming in from the companies themselves, like the big debate on Twitter uh, just now because of changes that the CEO wants to make, the new CEO wants to make to the API, or legislation such as privacy laws that are preventing access. These issues are leading to new methodological challenges. Challenges include such things as how do we understand our data given we're only getting a sample, most of our methods are designed to be robust in the face of very little missing data, maybe less than 10%. The data sets that we're getting now have 30% or more missing data. The data sets we're getting now are also geotemporally highly skewed and vary dramatically with the volatility of geotemporal activity. And though the techniques that we often have that we want to apply to these may assume we only have a few variables for which have lots and lots of data, or we have lots and lots of data geographically, but it's only for a single time shot. We don't have techniques that bring together time and space to help us infer missing data and to help us understand the data better. Finally, that from a social science perspective, a lot of the things we're concerned about are problems where we're only consumed, concerned with a few actors. I mean, there's only so many senators, right? Okay, but you, you have lots and lots and lots of data points, and so you have more variables than you actually do data. So you have wide data, so you need new techniques. I'm going to illustrate these problems and one additional one using a variety of things our group have done. Hidden behind all this is the fact that any data scientist who's going out looking at problems like these finds themselves in a realm not of using a single tool, but of using large numbers of tools that have to be designed from the get-go to be interoperable, and the ones listed here are just examples of some of those. So let's look at the first issue of suspended data. So I could give you lots of different, ex I'm sorry, of sample data. I could give you lots of examples, but the one I'm going to draw on is from some work we're doing on early warning for tsunamis. Now, the overall system is multi, um, multidisciplinary, multi-university. It's huge. It's in Indonesia. And it's trying to understand, using a land and water-based system, how can we take the signal that we detect that the tsunami wave is coming, get the information out to the public rapidly so that they have those few extra minutes, which are absolutely crucial for evacuating, because you only have a few minutes in the case of oncoming tsunamis. Our part in it is developing a Twitter system, and we're doing this in Indonesia. Indonesia is the Twitter capital of the universe, and so we actually have a lot of Twitter data we can actually utilize here. But for this to work, the data has to be representative. You want to know where the people are, so you hope that Twitter's covering where the people actually are. And you want to identify the local opinion leaders through Twitter so that you can send messages to them to let the rumor mill get out the information that the uh, event is coming. But if you look at the data, it really depends on when you collect it. So like any case, Twitter data has a very strong uh, temporal signal. That is, you get very distinct patterns by day of week, time of day, et cetera. But on any given day, it may look nothing like the norm. And then, you know, if there's a local soccer event or the local rock star gets mugged or whatever, all your data goes out the window and things look completely different than the norm. The second thing is where's the data coming from? And on the, what you're seeing here up here is a map of, of Padang, Indonesia, which is where we've actually been doing this. And the lighter the blue, the more tweets the, and the more tweeters in that particular area. Now, it turns out that a lot of the population we care about lives right down along here where there's very little tweet activity. Uh, and moreover, these areas here, you'd say, well, are they representative of the population who lives in those areas? The answer is no. That's where it just happens to be where the universities are. And that's where the most people are who are tweeting. Um, so then we say, well, okay, maybe at least we can get to those people and use this system, and we can use them as local opinion leaders. So we can actually utilize high, uh, new uh, network techniques that have been scaled up for really big data to actually analyze this and identify the local opinion leaders. But when we do that, who are they? They're girls between 15 and 17 years old. <laughs> and I will tell you, no Indonesian is going to listen to them when it comes to evacuating for a tsunami. Okay. So, what do, so that's an example of the problems with the kind of sample data that we're now getting. 
Let's turn on now to the case of geotemporal volatility. Here we're going to go a very different kind of problem that we often face, and that is dealing with issues like state stability. Our case studies here are mainly drawn from the Middle East, largely because we have lots and lots of data on the area around the Arab Spring. But I'm going to start with a particular event, the Benghazi Consulate attack. Now, the Benghazi Consulate attack is a very interesting example because it's something where we happen to be able in real time to analyze and figure out what was going on, and you could actually utilize big data techniques and data science techniques to go in and figure out where, who, who was responsible for the attack, what was causing it, and to compare it with other attacks. There was actually an attack shortly after that that was on the Cairo embassy, and you could actually compare these two using various data science techniques. Now, at the time, everybody blamed this event um, uh, on, in fact, the movie The Innocence of Muslims and argued that this was a public uprising against the U.S. In point of fact, because we have this long historical data, we could see that there were all these long-standing uh, temporal trends in the, in the in there, and that the attacks actually occurred almost in a data lull from a social media perspective. There was absolutely no signal in the Libya data, which by the way is this kind of bottom line here, that there was going to be an attack. There was one in the Egyptian one. In fact, they attack basically every week. Okay, so you could see the ground swelling rise, and that one just swell. We then look, you then go in and look at what, where is this data coming from? Well, this is a typical retweet network for this, for this time. This is actually for Benghazi, um, and it's the retweet network. You say, well, who are the opinion leaders? Who is it who's spreading the information? You know, maybe this is, you know, groups who care about. Well, it turns out all these central actors in here, sorry, all these central actors, these big ones here who are leading this explosion of retweets, are the newspapers. They're the online versions of BBC, et cetera. What they're doing is they represent almost less than 1% of the tweeters out there, but they are among the top 1% most retweeted. And they're actually controlling the discussion, and in particular, the discussion of the movie The Innocence of the Muslims, which people talked about as causing it. There was no signal in Egypt or Syria that this had anything to do with the uprisings. But in point of fact, all that discussion occurred after the attacks, and it was all fomented by the news uh, speculating. So the data science, in fact, could help you look at this and actually predict what was going on in these real evolutions, but was almost used more as a forensic device. Now that we have lots and lots of data, though, we can become more systematic in the analysis and say if we go across lots of countries and over time, uh, how are the different kinds of media used differently? How are they used the same and so on? And what we're finding are patterns like in low civil unrest countries there's very distinctive patterns. There's things you will discuss in the media, there's things you'll discuss in Twitter, and the two may not have the same thing to do with it. So you talk about adaptability in the newspapers, but not on Twitter, which is where you talk about ethnic groups. Um, in high civil unrest countries, you get very, very different patterns. So the way the media is used, and the way social media is used will vary, again, by country and by time. If I go back to some of these countries today that are now more stable, you get very different patterns than you got at the time we collected this data, which is when they were in high levels of instability. Going even still further, that's partly because the way people are using these systems varies dramatically, and you find that out by having tons of data at your fingertips that you can analyze it. In low civil unrest countries, what we find is that on average, people are using um, social media for personalized discussions. Hey, did you go to see that soccer match last night? What do you want to go for dinner? In high civil unrest countries, on the other hand, they're using it to get the message out. They're using it to you know, say, hey, you know, we're being attacked, or the civil liberty is being taken away, or let's all meet at this place for a protest, and things like that. Very, very different use of these media. So again, when you collect it and what country matters. But more pernicious than this has to do with the fact that Twitter itself and other social media providers are actually controlling what data you have access to. One of the things that they do is they suspend users. So Twitter retains the right to suspend users, and they typically suspend things like bots, uh, so non-human actors, but they also suspend those who violate Twitter policies, and they will sometimes suspend people who are extremists. And the amount that they're suspending and the number of, of things suspended actually varies dramatically by country and by time. So the darker the orange here, the more uh, individuals, the more tweeters from those countries are being suspended, even when control for uh, times when the tweet, supposedly the internet was out, which never really was, and times when, and the number of tweeters in the country. And they expect can be as great as 25% of the nodes in your data set may be suspended. 
okay? Which means that when the data is analyzed, you may get dramatically different results than if you collect it, say, a year later, because they'll be suspended and no longer there. Uh, this has big impact on the metrics that we all use. So we'd like to think of the measures that we use in science as being very robust and very good. But in point of fact, a lot of the metrics, particularly social network metrics, are very, very fragile. Now, there's it's one particular metric, and not only are they fragile, it's hard to predict the nature of their fragility based on removal of nodes or removal of in this case, the tweeters. There's this one measure called closeness, for example, which really is trying to get at this idea that when I talk or say something, what is the likelihood that it's going to rapidly get to everybody in that community? Okay, so I'm close to everybody. And it turns out that when you remove suspended actors, neither the exact number of those suspended nor, um, nor the fraction of the people suspended actually determines the direction that closeness will change. Sometimes it goes up, sometimes it, go down, it goes down, then that will vary distinctly based on the underlying network structure, not on the number of suspenses. But this it can have huge impacts on your results, and again, this varies dramatically by country and by time. Here we see 50% uh, complete difference in some of the cases, both up and 50% down. What this means for you as a scientist is that your results uh, may really not be very good at predicting. Okay, so we look at, for example, just simply having 25% of the nodes removed, if we're trying to predict, you know, who's the most influential, the chance that you predicted someone as being the top, you know, even among the top three most influential person, your person was there correctly, drops to 60%. You're not doing much better than guessing. So we need to get better and develop more robust network statistics is one story. Okay, next thing I want to talk about is this notion of Y data. Again, Y data is where you have lots and lots of variables and very few cases. We're going to look at a story here that deals with cyber attacks, the elf and troll, I am not making up those names, the elf and troll propaganda war that's going on with Russia, and of course ISIS. In all of these cases, what they have in common from a wide data perspective is that they're wide data problems where you've got a very small signal that is spatially and temporally distributed among an ocean of data. And so you're trying to find these actors who are hiding in plain sight, but they're secondary actors. They're never going to be the most, the, the top of the list, they're never going to be at the bottom of the list. Techniques like spectral clustering, lasso procedures, geotemporal visualization are needed in order to begin to ferret out what's going on here. And one of the reasons this is a wide data problem is because you're always in the realm of fusing data. Let's start with semantic data, which has to do with cyber attacks. Using that, idea, using that information, we can identify those countries that are most likely to be attacked and by what kind of attack. So for example, not surprisingly, uh, the US and the UK are most likely to be attacked by website attacks. And across gloringly a lot around the world, website attacks are becoming increasingly common. Now you would say, well, that's really because China and Russia are all attacking the US. Most of those attacks on the US are not coming from China and Russia. They're coming from wayport countries. What is a wayport country? That's a country who, if I'm one country and I, and I really want to attack Russia, but I don't want to do it directly, I'm going to send my attacks through a wayport, a different country, and it'll get from there to Russia, okay? There are countries that can, that in, perhaps inadvertently propagate, and there's only certain kinds of attacks you can do this way. The countries that have this feature are Latvia, Moldova, Georgia, and Croatia, and Argentina, Niger, uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, etc. Now, that's kind of really interesting to know, okay? That means Russia's not attacking us, but they're sending attacks on Georgia, who's sending them on to us. Okay, got that. But why, how, do we, how do you stop this? How do you think about this? Well, to do this, you bring into account information from other sources, um, such as world, uh, world facts about these various countries. And what you find is the most common things that these countries have in common is a high level of corruption uh, relative to their GDP, and also the fact that all these countries have a, lots of computers relative to the number of people, but they have really poor IT infrastructure support and services and so on. In other words, they're using outdated machines, okay? So you get lots of exploits. Going further into this, 
Well, is it really Russia attacking us through attacking Georgia? Well, it turns out when you look into this more, you say maybe we can predict it using the data in, in, that's in the Twitter sphere and in social media. And it turns out there's a lot of information in uh, social media about who's attacking each other uh, using cyber attacks and how these are even related to dirty bomb attacks and various things like that. So you can dig in and find that information, and when you do that, what you're starting to see emerging is this picture of the former members of the USSR all attacking each other in cyberspace. And in fact, it's, it's really that the former members, the, is that these countries are attacking Russia more than Russia is attacking them, like the Ukraine. They attack Russia more than Russia attacks them, but they whine about it in cyberspace. They whine about it in the Twitter sphere all the time. And they whine much more than Russia does, because Russia doesn't talk in the Twitter sphere to anybody but other members of Russia. And, even, and we don't know if that's true on uh, other sites like BK. Um, so anyway, you've got this kind of thing going on, which means this is part of, the cyber attacks are part of the propaganda war that involves the anti-Russian elf army that's on Twitter and the Russians themselves. And so you wanted them to be able to find this elf army. Well, finding the elf army is a lot like finding members of ISIS who are also engaged in other propagation campaigns. And in both of these cases, what, you need to, what we're finding useful is to employ techniques from traditional social sciences like snowball sampling, et cetera, coupling this in with some of these big data techniques, coupling that in with special machine learning techniques designed for broad data, and so on. And then pushing it up, sorry some of the statistical techniques for wide data, along with certain machine learning techniques for identifying groups like spectral clustering. With going on from that, uh, in summary, you've got lots of data, but it's increasingly compromised or increasingly uh, constrained in what you can pull out of it. New methodologies need to be created to deal with all this high level of bias in the, exist in the new data. And as scientists, we need to think about not just geocorrelation, but interpretation, not just temporal correlation, but forecasting. Move from standard statistics to some of these new ones. And then if you're a network analyst, you've got to quit doing simple social networks and move to more high dimensional networks. Thank you. Um, but hopefully, you'll notice there's a constant flow of data across the screen, indicating kind of moment by moment changes in the vehicle, right? So you saw things like pitch, roll, torque, position.